My name's Maddie. I, um, let's see, what about me? Uh, most recently, I just sued the NIH along with a couple <laughs> other plaintiffs and one, yeah. which is wild. But yeah, my background. <laughs> um, okay, so let me, let me, okay, yeah, yeah. All right, let me do this then. Okay, so before the NIH lawsuit, yeah. <laughs> you worked with primates, right? Mm -hmm. How did you get into working with primates? How does, how does one find themselves in the University of Madison, Wisconsin, um, uh, speaking sign language with monkeys, or I don't know, what, what were you doing? Uh, <laughs> Not that. <laughs> depriving, I, I was going to say something worse, like uh, dep yeah. depriving monkeys of food and water in order to get them to perform tricks under duress. Um, so that's probably more similar, although my job was, I was an actual caretaker. So that would have been like, you know, what studies were taking place is, yeah. you know, a lot of times that's a very standard practice is limiting, you know, generally water or food intake to get them, you know, give them incentive to perform. But from like, for me, my job was actually, um, I was a student animal caretaker. So during my undergraduate education, um, my job was to care for the 500 plus monkeys that were in this lab. There are actually two labs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So they've got around 2,000 monkeys total. Um, I was in yeah. the smaller lab um, named after Harry Harlow. The Harlow lab is the one that's the the one that's kind of the famous one, right? The one that does yes. the cocaine experiments, the one that's done. So, yeah, I mean, Harry Harlow is definitely a pretty famous, infamous um, individual. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the lab that I was in. Uh, Harlow is known for the really brutal studies on infant monkeys, um, mm -hmm. the cloth mom versus the wire mom, right. um, the yeah. like pit of, <laughs> I call it the pit of despair, but it's like the deprivation, um, the sort of like deprivation. Right, where the, uh, the lab the lab workers would wear masks when they fed them and all of that. Yeah, and like the monkeys food. are in this sort of like thing where basically they get to this point where they like they're trying to get out, but they kind of realize that they're never getting out. And so then they just kind of end up in despair. <sighs> yeah. Now, you know, granted, this was so this was Harlow's research and Harlow had passed away long before, mm -hmm. you know, I was there. But this is the same lab. It's named after him. Named after him yeah. Um, you know, so. So how do you end up in this? Were you studying? What were you? How do you end up being a caretaker? I don't like that's yeah. something that blows my mind because I, I did a um, I did a tour of college campuses. I've been to Madison, Wisconsin. I was there um, when they bought their latest batch of marmosets in order mm. to do sleep deprivation experiments on them. Um, I've I don't know. It's it's a it's a horrific it's a horrific thing. I think that was Madison. Yeah, it was Madison. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 most of the students don't even know that it exists. They don't I even know. know what's happening there. Um, and you just fell into. Were you a student at Madison? Is that what happened? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I um, was there for my undergraduate education, and you know, like I don't know, so many people. I grew up loving animals. Um, very mm -hmm. much an animal lover who you know did not have any understanding of sort of the injustices that took place. Um, so, you Very know, cool. when I went to, when I went to school um, at UW, I, you know, I had grown up really fascinated with Jane Goodall and her work um, doing, you know, studying chimpanzees and looked up, looked up to her, um, but kind of, to be honest, um, the sciences scared me. I didn't think I was smart enough to take the sciences. I had that like internalized, I don't know, like maybe like women can't do science thing or something. That's, like, I mean, that's literally how Jane Goodall ended up in primatology and anthropology was because of, well, there's a lot of glass ceiling stuff that was happening, right. but also just this in, this inferiority complex that happens right. with women scientists. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that had like kind of kept me because all of the like classes about animals are in the sciences. And so I was like having this issue of like, you know, you to to uh, major in zoology, I had to take chemistry and physics and botany and these things where I'm like, why, you know? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there's um, this course that's called Animal Behavior: The Primates. And so before I had declared zoology as a major, I took that class because I was really interested in it, and mm -hmm. I thought it was just going to be like a biology credit. I wasn't at that point like 
going to go that route necessarily. And that class, I was, this was my freshman year of college, and <laughs> it just sort of reawakened this passion, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting for a couple reasons. Um, one of which is uh, that the person who was teaching the class at the time was the director of the lab that I went on to work in. Oh. So this is someone who, you know, this class, from my my memory of it, a lot of it is just about sort of the different behaviors and species of, of primates. Like yeah. it's learning who they are and it's very much about like them in the wild and very little in my memory about anything related to sort of like in a research lab, that mm. kind of thing. So it's like building up this passion for these animals and the person who's, who's, you know, teaching the class, like they're making you fall in love with this when, yeah. you know, they're also in charge <laughs> of Harlem. Well, that's lab. so, you know, that's so interesting. I mean, I think a lot of people can relate that sometimes the heroes that inspire us are the villains of the story. Yeah. That's, I think that's far more common and not just in this, but in so many parts of our lives where the person, right who inspires us is the very person who we need to take down because they're the ones uh, yeah, who are torturing yeah. monkeys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's, it's definitely kind of a, a more, more common thing that sort of once, once you get some sort of power, no matter kind of what field or industry you're in, sometimes you're not. Yeah. The, the good that even you might have been trying to do is sort of like, where is yeah. that anymore? Did you the lose power. your path? Yeah. yeah, the power and the lack of accountability. Yeah, they lose yes. their path because they lose perspective, right? They right. lose, they don't have anyone holding them accountable. They don't know, they don't right. remember how they got into it. So mm -hmm. you decided to, you want to be around them. I mean, I get the idea like, hey, I love animals. Oh my God, we have monkeys here. Yeah. I love monkeys. I want to be around the monkeys. How many people yeah. get to work with monkeys? Not many people. No, it's, you know? I mean, it felt like this really kind of special, unique opportunity. And the thing that really it was, kind of, yeah, no, I mean, it's it, the, the thing that sort of solidified it was there was a class. I mean, to this day, my memory is so distinct of this sitting in like the lecture hall and the professor puts up a photo of one of his prior students with Jane Goodall, like working with Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Maddie, who's like, who's preventing you from, from doing this? Like, right. I could be in the next picture. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I took the summer to kind of think it over, so to speak, and ended up declaring zoology as a major, deciding that, you know, if there's monkeys already on this campus, like the best way to set myself ahead and, and follow in the steps of Jane Goodall work in primate conservation is to get experience with monkeys. And I, I mean, truthfully, I, I, I just find it hard to sort of, I mean, I'm trying to remember, but basically my memory is very little was talked about as far as yeah. what it actually like in a lab. And I think even when yeah. someone like me who's been on the inside and shares about it, people still have their own ideas that they it's it's hard to truly understand how other wor worldly they are and not in a good way. Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean and also I mean actually every single thing about the labs is shocking for everyone who finds out about the numbers 120 million animals killed in labs in america every year the the, the 16 billion dollars of taxpayer money going to animal labs every year this the, like the numbers just alone are just mind-blowing right. and then you get to these the, the horrors of these and people they can't believe it. They think that they we're testing, we're testing. First of all, they think we're testing cosmetics. Yes, yes. Or, or we're testing penicillin on them or something. I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and they still, and it's funny because every case in use, what's it, um, case in, uh, what's it, care? Uh, what's that? There's a website on every college campus, there's a page called like the um, use and care page or something. Oh, like, are you talking about the IACA committees or just like yeah. the and okay? But yeah, I mean, yeah, basically like what details like this is how well we take care of the animals. Yes. And look at all of this oversight that takes place, and you know, and it's necessary because of insulin yes. isolation <laughs> and polio vaccine, right, and it's right. like insulin and polio. Yeah. That's uh -huh. that's. 
that's that's almost a hundred years ago. Right, right. Yeah, like, no, they're still pointing to. I mean, and you know, I'm not going to deny it. Historically, in the past, like there have been for humans, very, you know, significant findings, whether or not people want to talk about, is it worth it? Is it not fine? But what's not being talked about is like what's taking place today. Yeah. Even remotely, you know, coming up with, they're just pointing to what happened in, in the, his, in, in the past, because it's like, that's, that's all true. they've got. <laughs> well, they point, yeah. They point to the past to validate what they're doing today. Like everything, like eating animals too. Right. right. But it's, um, right. But the thing about the the animal exploitation when it comes to vivisection, I think that we we say these like there's been human uses for mm. like animal sacrifice, human use, and uh, has saved human lives. But the animal sacrifice is almost unnecessary. We have microdosing. We have we could have skipped the animal trials and gone mm. to human trials way earlier, way faster, and and with the and and with human relevance. That it it it's almost as if we never needed to test the polio vaccine on animals. I mean, yeah. the polio vaccine you needed chickens to get there. So I don't know that like I don't mm-hmm. know how else back then that's how you made vaccines was uh, yeah chicken vaccines basically <laughs> yeah you're trying to <laughs> kill yeah it's weird how they do it but it's um, yeah. Salk or whatever his name is but anyway all right so. Yeah. One thing I will say, like related to this topic on on topic is that for anyone who's like really interested in diving into the history of animal research, Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the middle of this book. It is written by Richard J. Miller. It is called The Rise and Fall of Animal Experimentation. And he uh, worked in animal experimentation, I believe, for almost 50 years um, and is now advocating for a move away from it. This book was just published like maybe a year ago or something. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, it's going back to like, I don't know, like ancient Greece and stuff talking about yeah. literally like how it came to be and how a lot of the justifications of what was taking place then are still being used today mm-hmm. when it doesn't make sense. Um, so anyway, I think it's a really important read for anyone trying to kind of understand the history and how that plays into t- today. To I love today. the title, the rise yes. and fall, the rise and fall of the Third Reich. It makes yeah. you think of yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, any because I'm uh, at at my core, I'm just a guy that hates Nazis. So I um, so I, <laughs> that's just like kind of my that's that's reasonable. My, yeah, one of my I th- I feel like it should be reasonable, but it doesn't yeah. seem like it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But so anything that's like rise and fall of the of animal that sounds great. Yes. Yeah. So okay, so you find yourself in charge of. There's mm-hmm. now there's thousands. You said there's two thousand monkeys here. You're now a yeah. caretaker for them. And my experience, my experience meeting caretakers, you're like, you're you're feeding them, making sure they're taking the their poop is out and like all the other stuff, right? You think you're t- you're basically uh taking care of the kennel. Yeah. So I yeah, just like a quick summary of like what, especially as a student caretaker. Mm. Um, so we were like part time, um, usually about 10 to 12 hours a week. But our sort of main gigs were usually on the weekends because students were responsible for um, the weekend. So like every other weekend, I would be at the lab usually with one other student caretaker taking care of 500 plus monkeys, two oh. of us. 500 plus that we have to feed, do health checks, give any medications that are needed, um, hose down like the rooms and the the drop pans and stuff. Um, if there's babies, these are these are long tailed rhesus macaques. These are the um, so these primarily it was your general rhesus macaques. They did have um, some of the crab eating or the um, cinnamologous macaques. But these um, are like these are smart monkeys. They're not like the little yes, squirrely. They are big. Yeah. No, they and yeah, like I mean, we're talking like teeth that I've I have been bit. Um, Actually, I I would have had the tip of my finger taken off had I not had like a very thick leather glove on. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. I mean, it, it was hurting for days after, even though like I had two layers of like just your thin, like kind of medical gloves on mm-hmm. top with this like leather glove on. Oh so yeah, gosh. these are these are dangerous animals. Um, you know, they're wild animals, though. I, I think you had mentioned earlier um, something about like marmosets. The little monkeys are at the other lab that I didn't work in. Yeah, so they, it, they have the bigger ones, but they also had the little. My lab was the the bigger macaques. 
I, I could be wrong, but my assumption is that the big monkeys come from places like UC Davis or someplace that's like a, an internal breeding facility. And a dom- I shouldn't say internal, a domestic breeding facility. And that the marmosets seem to be wild caught every time. Every time I hear about marmosets, they're being shipped in from far away yeah. on boats or planes. Yeah, I, I can't speak so much to that, but I can say that Harlow Primate Lab, the one that I was at, is a breeding facility. Right, so okay. we were actually doing a lot of the breeding and then we'd be shipping monkeys elsewhere this and have so no crazy. idea what was going to happen. See, this them. is where I think the, the real insidious nature of this whole industry is because it's not about the experimentation. It's about the buying and selling of monkeys. Yeah. It's just another slave racket. Um and 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 the taxpayers fitting the bill is footing the bill because of this bullshit line about polio or something. Yeah. So, at, at at what point do you start looking at it though, Maddie? And you're like, what the hell are we like? You know that moment? There's there's a famous skit on where they they're like the the Nazis look at each other and like we have skulls on our hats. Are we the baddies? Mm. Are we the <laughs> Are we the baddies? Right, Are, right. We, we might be the baddies. Yeah. At what point do you do that when you're in these labs? Do you look at each other and you're like, have we crossed a line here? What are we doing? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple ways to answer that. I think there is this enormous kind of incentive and outward pressure to desensitize yourself, to um, justify what is going on and justifies the means, you know, we've, we've done this huge thing once before. So therefore anything we do is justified and is going to come up with some magical cure to whatever. Right. We kill so, one more. We'll yeah, save a billion yeah. lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you rather save this child than this yeah. mouse? Yeah. I've seen the posters, I know, they have poster I know. propaganda posters in these labs. I know. And that's, that's what we're surrounded by. And, yeah. you know, if you think about it too, a lot of us who go into these labs are young, impressionable people who, you know, I stars now, in your eyes. Right. Nowadays people are like, Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try her for anything. But then I kept my mouth shut. I wanted to, like, I obeyed authority. I followed everything rule by rule. If like I made a mistake, I like, like just to give you an example, my, my coworker, I think probably thought I was being ridiculous, but one day back in, back in college, so this was like 10 years ago and my alarm didn't go off because we lost power. And so, and I had like a plugged in alarm, like one does not my phone. Mm -hmm. And so I missed half of the shift that day, which meant that my coworker, and he couldn't get a hold of me because I had my phone turn off because I didn't want to be woken up in the middle of the night. We had to get up so early. And so I missed half my shift. I show up, he's already gone through and done everything for all 500 monkeys, except for all of the cleaning. And so I was just like, I am so sorry, go home. I will hose down the whole place. And he was like, great, sounds good. And I was like, afterwards, I then went and emailed my boss and was like, hey, I just want to let you know what happened. Uh You know, this happened. I own up to it. It won't happen again. I will get a second alarm clock. I sent so-and-so home. So I did this. So if you have any questions, like, about yeah. it like i can't answer them about earlier today this is goody why. two shoes and like i think my coworker was like you really didn't need to do-. and even my boss was like all right sounds good yeah. like, I was, <laughs> but that's who i was like i was so afraid that like something would happen and then they'd be like maddie answer this question about what mm. happened at this time and it was like so like this is who i was i was so afraid like even when my gut is starting to like be like ah, i don't really like this i'm questioning what's going on here I was way too afraid to rock any sort of boat. So what changed? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean. Isn't that what we all go through? Though? I think that everyone watching knows that we go through life afraid to rock the boat. We go through yeah. life. To, we go through life afraid to question. Yeah. Um, especially things that are shouted at us, things that are said with such confidence. Yeah. We think. Oh, okay. We just go along with it. Yeah. It's easier to go along right. with it. Well, because they were point, the experts. I was yeah. like, we must know, you know, like, even though this is my experience, is my experience as valid as, as whatever they can tell me should or shouldn't be happening or is right mm. or wrong. And, you know, I really didn't have a lot of like awareness of like mental health issues and stuff at that point. Um, I, you know, I I wasn't in therapy ever. So like, I also had no idea what I was doing to myself 
Like mm. I, it wasn't until like years later when I, or even like as I, after I left the lab, when I really started having nightmares all the time of being back in the lab and being like, why am I here? And like, I'd literally be like, why did I come back to volunteer? Like, yeah. and I, it, it was like my own heart was torturing me. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, over time, at, I started to, I know like one of, one of the couple things that was really influential for me was meeting a couple people who had also worked in labs and had kind of joined the other side or joined the animal rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so like um, Katie Conley Griffin, right? I believe who was with HSUS. Mm -hmm. um, she was one of the first people I ever met who had said like, yeah, I worked in a lab and then I went into animal protection. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is so nice to hear because I was so afraid that like, like I wanted to help animals, but I was afraid that animal rights activists would be like, what are you doing here? Like, yeah. you have no business being here. And and not to say like the worst things said to me have been from animal rights activists. So that's yeah, I mean, some of us are like, I'm yeah. kind of an asshole animal rights <laughs> activist. I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been known to be, you know, a little bit of a stickler on some things. So I know that I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, it's isolating. So it was like, and then I remember a couple years later, like I came across Dr. John Gluck's book, um, mm. Voracious Science and Vulnerable Animals, a primate scientist ethical journey. Um, he worked for 40 years uh, in primate research. He actually worked under Harry Harlow at the same lab that I did. Um, and when I read his book, where he's literally describing hallways that I know, like it was so wild. Yeah. Um, I... I was just like met with just like this wave of like, okay, first of all, he knows so much more than I do. He remembers so much more than I do. And he put this all in a book and like out there and nothing happened to me. Cause for so long I was afraid, like, am I going to get sued? Am I going to get like, are they going to yeah, come what, after me? Mm -hmm. Cause I, I didn't have know what I had signed. I, you know, I had oh, totally. Cause you, I know exactly what you mean. Cause you're <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, here's a bunch of papers to sign on your first day. And then they stare right. at you and you're like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. Uh-huh. And mm -hmm. it's really, you know, it's scary to really not know if you're going to be protected. If you, if what, if yeah, what's going to happen, if your career is going to be ruined. I mean, all of these things are going sure. through my mind Yeah, and I'm not even sure if like what I'm feeling at that point is valid, even though I know it is at this point, but it's, it's just, it's complicated. Like the, well, of as course you it grow is. up, I think, <laughs> I think also like, Everybody who is, I think, all right, everyone who is experiencing this and is it is a critical thinker and is um, and is listening to their conscience, there has to be a part where all it, all truly intelligent people are questioning themselves, right? They're going, wait a second, am I crazy? Am I the crazy one? I still sometimes feel that way. Like I'm like, oh, there's people. There, I went to a supermarket today and I, there was so much flesh on display yeah. that I couldn't – it was just – it was overwhelming. And right. I went, uh, am I the crazy one? Yeah. Am I th – I'm the weirdo who thinks this is wrong. And and I'm like, no, I'm not crazy. This is actually crazy. Yeah. It, 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 and, but I had to – even – I've been vegan 20 years. I, I still have those moments where I'm like, yeah. wait a second. <laughs> yeah. No, it's – I mean – yeah, there's and it's important to have that. It's right. gut check time. And it's a lot harder to kind of think critically about things when you're surrounded by people who are wanting you to think a certain way. So whether it's it, brought limiting cliches how we are eating animals or what when we're researching animals, it's like if you're in an animal lab, everybody is like, Yeah, we're we're using these animals, like this is we this is why we do it. How this it's is done. How we should do it, mm -hmm. you know. What going against that is very scary. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you, one of the things that people continue to ask is like, why didn't you ever say anything while you were there? And it's like, I knew what would happen if I yeah. said anything. Like, the, I would immediately be labeled an activist. And, you know, then I don't know who else is going to like take my place and care for these animals and if they will show the same level of compassion that I did. And that's not to say, you know, I think. There's actually a lot of people like me who have ended up in animal research for whatever reason. And 
it can be because they love animals and they don't Often. have any yeah idea of what this is actually going to look like for the animals and also what it's going to do to them psychologically. So fast forward a little bit. How do we get to where we are today? You're you're in this. <laughs> you're, you're you're overcoming some of these misgivings, and then um, and you're meeting some activists and. Uh, what, connect the dots for me. How do we get? How yeah. do we get to where we are today? So, uh, also, I, I'm un, I'm unfamiliar. I, I'm, I would never ask you your age, but what year? <laughs> what year are we talking about to now? Um, yeah. So yeah. So I worked in the lab from 2011 to 2013. So these were okay. my last two years of college. Um. So fast forward to now, that was like 11 years ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, but basically what happened was, is I would say in the last five or so, well, yeah, five, six years, I always kind of, the timeline's a little, eh. of course. Um, yeah. and again, part of this is, um, I suppressed a lot of my memories from the lab. Unfortunately, I still beat myself up for it. I know well, you, I you said that you said you went to therapy, you were diagnosed yeah. with PTSD. These yeah. are, uh, these are. This is traumatic experience. That makes yeah, I was I was dissociating to to function to be a college student. So like when you had said like, oh, are you in there doing sign language? Like it reminded me of people who would be like, it's so cool that you spend your days playing with monkeys, and I'd be like, yeah. totally. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I didn't want to say the thing no, that I know no, actually yeah, happens. Yeah. You know, like. Well, but I mean you know, they've, they've actually done these sign language studies, but it's more with yeah. apes. So, right. um, with, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's interesting. Cause again, as you said, most people don't know animal research is taking care, taking place on their campus and they, or if they do, they have no real concept of what it looks like and mm -hmm. what goes into it. So, um, basically as I started to meet more people and kind of feel more supported and kind of, feel like I wanted to take on my own mental health a little more and like maybe talking about it would be helpful. I started sharing my story a little bit um, through social media, mostly Instagram. And um, at first when I was doing that, I wasn't even like mentioning Madison. Like it was just like, I have this memory of when I worked in a lab and blah, blah, blah. And mm. people were like, wow, like I'm, you know, they were very supportive and receptive of it. And so as that started to happen, I was like, okay, like maybe I'm not going to get attacked. Maybe sharing this is actually, you know, going to help with healing and maybe also raise awareness. So I got to a point where I was like, I'm going to tag UW Madison. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. Like I'm going to make it clear that this is where this happened. Like I'm going to start okay. putting them into the conversation. So I was tagging them in my posts and also commenting on some of their posts. Um, Okay, to get, get a little. Uh, so you're hanging out with you're hanging out with some agitators at this point. I'm guessing. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, I mean, I I had definitely at that point like moved from. I mean, keep in mind, I went into the lab as a meat eater. I came out vegetarian. Two days, two years later, vegan. Mm. Ended up like very much becoming like studying humane education, becoming a public speaker, doing like education and outreach on all of the different animal rights issues. So like I grew a lot, like at the same time that all of this is happening, I'm really kind of gaining confidence and knowledge about these issues and all yeah. of the injustice taking place to animals. And so as that was taking place and as I was sort of feeling better about, about sharing the truth, mm -hmm. I also was feeling better about sharing my truth. And so that's sort of your healing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it's definitely like, it's interesting because it's definitely not like this, like perfect path of healing. Like there were times where I'd be like, before, never these, yeah, before these lawsuits, like right before we knew that we were going to announce the, the UW Madison lawsuit, I um, gave myself high blood pressure, like to the oh, point bet. that like, I like doctors were like, you're going to need to go on medication if you can't get this under control. So like, I, you know, it's hard to like, yeah. all of a sudden dive back into things that were very traumatic. Yeah. Um, and to kind of relive that and also know that like, some of the monkeys that I knew are probably still sitting in those damn cages. Oh, you, you think because they live 
quite yeah, a they long use time. Them. They, yeah, I mean, when I worked there, there were monkeys that were my age. Um, so because the breeding 20s. facility, because I, yeah. I, I guess that's Some of interesting. the males were in their okay. 20s. Because yeah. my, my understanding is that they kill them after the they experiments, do, yes. right? But um, there are some, like there were some of the males that were for breeding were purposes. Old. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, there's babies being born all the time and they're being shipped elsewhere. So you never know. So they are going to be killed at some point, but you never know. Like, are they being used for like an aging study? Matt yeah. Matt is doing aging studies. So, like, yeah, there's, I mean, there's no, there's no sanctuary. There's no monkey sanctuary for X, uh, X. Yes, like, there the, are. There well, are. Well, yeah, I mean, for, by activists, right? There's not like Madison yeah. is putting them on oh, a no, nice no, little no. farm at the end. They're, no, 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 no. they separate their heads or well, I, I don't know how they actually execute them, but they, yeah, it's um, usually a spinal column thing, right? That it, they, yeah, it depends on what they're being used for. I mean, I, there was one monkey that I did have to, I was asked to assist with the euthanasia for, um, because honestly he was disabled. I mean, they couldn't figure out what was going on with him, but he basically Ugh. couldn't, he, he would be at the bottom. He was like a, like a one to two year old macaque. So smaller, mm. um, but not a baby. And he like would lay at the bottom of his cage and couldn't move with his arms and legs. So you had to like feed him. Like I called him, I gave him like this name Cheerio because you would, feed Cheerios to his mouth and he was still like very much like there like mm -hmm. his eyes were bright he was yeah. eager to eat um but they you know they decided that well they can't use him he's right. disabled and, monkey and and it, yeah and there's no you know despite the fact that I'm sure a sanctuary would have taken him on and tried to work with him literally yeah. I spent I spent New Year's that year like watching the light fade from his eyes and it was just yes. devastating i mean when i was at university of madison i had a, a student tell me that they put the monkeys on a, on a on a happy little monkey farm when they're done i'm like no 100 percent of them will end up dead like yeah, no. they're, they're killing um, all of them yeah very very few ever make it to sanctuary and if they do it's a very secret process because right. they don't they don't want to have don't want the attention and they don't want people to think that they they need sanctuary of so course not yeah it. yeah imagine imagine if you had thousands of monkeys yeah. at sanctuaries with missing fingers and missing yeah. limbs no. and they all look like yeah. rocket raccoon yeah. and stuff yeah they don't want that like i mean no 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 so yeah. What was the genesis of the lawsuit, though? Like, I don't. Yeah. How did that actually happen? Because that's fascinating. You didn't just wake up one day and like I'm going to sue my alma mater. No, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so basically, I said that I had tagged them in some posts, and they, you know, so on Instagram, if you tag someone and like they have their tags open, you can go to their tagged photos and see your posts. And so what I noticed is every time I tagged them in a post, they untagged themselves. And um, so Ooh. the thing the thing about this is they are a government funded right. university. So they are, you know, they're getting tax dollars, especially for this research. And I am caught like I am talking as an alumni, as a former lab worker about what's going on and they're untagging themselves. And also I started, you know, bringing stuff up on their posts and they were actually deleting my comments. So they, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's and, violation and that's violation of freedom of speech. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that's how this came about is I had gone to my friend at the time who worked for ALDF animal legal defense fund. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you think of this? And he was like, Hmm, um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to some people. And that is how, um, the lawsuit against Madison came about because we started figuring out that they, I mean, we did like the FOIA request and found out that they were in fact censoring me personally. Um, yeah. How did FOIA even have that info? That's amazing that FOIA yeah. would even produce and what, I what think, came well, because, back from FOIA? I that think, you, well, what, I had you got it out for a minute. Yeah. I had some proof and then I think it was, I know also discovery had shown some of that. So that was after the lawsuit would have taken place. I can say for sure the FOIA requests. So one of the other aspects, we, we sue them. Right. And, yeah. and you know, it's who's about, we, who's we, sorry, like me and ALDF animal legal okay. defense fund. They're my, yeah, um, yeah. they, they represent me in both cases, but um, 
So we we sue them because they are censoring me. And after suing them, um, a friend oh, of mine, uh, Ryan, who is the other plaintiff on the NIH case, aside from PETA, he was the one, you know, we were we were talking through things. And what we noticed was that I had at some point stopped being personally sent like uh, personally censored. But there were comments that weren't showing up. Like I was like, I said something and then it was like, I know someone would say something to this or react and I'm seeing my comment. So what's going on? And what we found out as we were kind of going back and forth was that like there were certain, we started to think like, okay, it seems like there's certain words that if you use this, then your comment doesn't show oh, up. Oh, they were, uh, they were yeah, using they were doing the keyword. censored or blocked yeah, word list. Yeah. So this is how we found out that UW Madison was doing this. So then Ryan put in this FOIA request and got the lists and we were like, oh my God. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and so of course, you know, this is, we add this to the lawsuit, like include it because that doesn't just affect me, that affects everyone. So anyone who wants to go and start right. talking about what they're doing in their labs, that these lists were made up almost entirely of animal research terms, um, including like Harlow, Sumi, very famous, mm -hmm. uh, primate researchers um like they were very quickly yeah. trying to keep people from talking about i them. read a, a torture was one of the yeah. words yeah. Kill. i mean even even just like stop animal testing oh yeah, um, yeah. hashtag primate. stop animal testing yeah, yeah the hashtag was not... Peta, um Peta yeah. was out yeah so, yeah so it was very specific like it's not you know, they was clear what they were trying to do. Oh, I so, love this so much because, like, uh, the ram no the idea that they're that this was happening and and how pervasive it is. So it was it was after this then that we were like, I, I around the same time I had started commenting on NIH because I was like, you know, the NIH is is funding. They're the ones, this. yeah. They're the money, yeah. And we were like, wouldn't it be wild if the NIH was doing this too? Because we were seeing again, <sighs> comments that we are making are not there. And so again, Ryan did the FOIA request and we were like, oh my gosh. And apparently at the same time this was happening, PETA was also pulling that together. And so that's how the Knight Institute Animal Legal Defense Fund and the three of us plaintiffs came together against the NIH because we realized they were doing it as well. And again, it's wow. our tax swap dollars. Like you're yeah. a government organization. Yeah, you're accountable to us. Yes. You and, answer to us. Yeah. And the thing is, too, is there are other universities doing this. We have done FOIA requests. That's the other thing. That's what I was just thinking. They're not the only ones. Yeah. I guarantee you the NIH. It just, yeah. it just I guarantee mm -hmm. you the USDA is doing shit like yes. this. Yes, of course. So, yeah, Ryan had done some others at like major universities that had animal yes. testing. The lists were made up very similar similarly of the, these these words related to animal research. I love and this so, so much. Like the two things, the two, I, I, yeah. the two things I care most about as an American, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, no, animal, wild. animal rights and, and my first amendment, right. Yeah. To talk uh, about animal rights. Right. And right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And so the lawsuit went and, and you won and that just <laughs> happened. Yeah, yeah, it just so, happened. <laughs> but it's not over, right? There's more. So, oh yeah. So what happened was is the NIH lawsuit was initially ruled against us. We weren't, I mean, you know, this very powerful industry, we know what we're up against. The case to us, you know, it's just, it's so obvious. Like if you're funding this, you shouldn't be able to do this. And yet it was ruled against us. So we well, appealed. Who made the ruling, I guess, is the question, right? Was that? Um, yeah, the like the district court or whatever. It was district court. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't like an arbitration or something like that. It no, was actually like a no, judge. It, yes. And so then we appealed and um, the appeal took place on like, I don't know, when was it? It was... Somewhere around the beginning of, or end of April, I believe. And so um, you, so let, let me just to get a little bit further yeah. and a little granular because I'm yeah. interested. Uh, so you're, you're suing them inside of Wisconsin, I'm guessing. You're, so you're suing them, you're bringing, so, you're bringing suit against them. Well, this is, so this is the NIH case. Oh, so you're bringing to, so it's DC. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. so it's the federal yeah. it's the first it would be the first first circuit. Yeah, so it was the DC circuit that ultimately okay. um up uh like uh, they said decided- no dice. Yes, they basically like when we appealed they said, "Yeah, like you actually we're, so the we're, first, like, the, what is that? The first appellate court or whatever it would be then? Yes. 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 Sorry, okay. I'm still, like, getting these terms down. I'm not oh. the lawyer, obviously. So, <laughs> Neither am um, I. I'm just, I'm just crazy about, like, because yeah. uh, the, the, appeal, the appeal process when it comes to this, because it could go, because something like that could go to the Supreme Court, but it, right. it would first go, cause the reason why I was so, asking, because it could have gone all the way up to the state Supreme Court, uh, which right. would have been. But if it's so, yeah, DC, it's the first they thing. basically reversed the original right. ruling. Um, it's obviously to be determined if uh, the NIH is going to come back and try to further fight things. But we're taking this as a major win. Um, so, I don't know. I yeah, I can't speak from again the lawyer perspective and what's but what going does on the win there. mean today? If, let's say let's say they don't appeal and the yeah. NIH rolls over and says, "Mea culpa, uh, we're such assholes. We've always been assholes. We're just going to forget about this and you know, like <laughs> you know, deal with it." Um, what what does that mean today? Um, yeah. So, I mean, that is one of the things that, like, I think my lawyers are probably like, I've got to get a little more info on them as far as like what gets carried out. Because at, at this point, what I know is that the ruling's been reversed. And so, and they are basically saying that the way that they were carrying themselves at this point is violating First Amendment. First Amendment. Yeah. So, it's a know, big one. It's the first, right, it's the right. first one. <laughs> So yeah. that being said, obviously some things need to change. What is going to happen? You know, I I can't say for sure at this point, but mm. I do think that it is, you know, it's a it's a big thing, especially because this comes back to my case against UW Madison, which they haven't so yeah. th- we sued the NIH after Madison, right? Yeah. This ruling came back before Madison, and now, you know, Madison was also ruled against me. Um, we appealed, and we but are now there's precedent. Yes. And now, with this ruling, yeah. I'm obviously yeah. hoping that it impacts, you know, their thoughts on this because it, it would have to. They're not going to want to go against jurisprudence of, of another think. court. Yeah. Right. I mean, especially because, again, it comes back to these are tax do- our tax dollars. Like, we have a right to discuss what how they're being used, what is taking place. And they know if you if they decide against you that you'll probably win an appeal and make them look like idiots. <laughs> so, like – Possibly, like, yeah. I don't know. Well, the chances <laughs> of you winning an appeal is, are quite high. If, I mean, yeah. it's a, they're, they're very high because you've already won the appeal process yeah. because this – all you need to do is get a judge who actually know a judge who's actually read the constitution. And, you know, I know they're few and far between these days because you never know who appointed these assholes, but you, you just need one who's actually yeah. read the constitution and yeah. you get it. So like, yeah. I, I'm fascinated by this. So, so there, I wonder if that also means that they'll have to delete all of these censoring um, all, they'll right. have to stop using the censoring tools of of Facebook or whatever they were using or yeah. Instagram. I whatever. mean, that's that would be, I mean, my hope, at least like part of this, because it's just, you know, it's like if you are, it's one thing to like have racial slurs on this list. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, hate but, speech isn't hate speech right. isn't protected by the First Amendment. Right. But, but the, you know, this is, I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't also. That's just, calling into question in a in a in a you know relatively polite way uh-huh. is absolutely protected under the first amendment you could right, right. if it's not hate speech or inciting violence you're protected and well it, and and that's the thing for me that i am you know and and we can talk about this later but i i am someone who very much advocates for compassion shown toward people who work in labs. I was one of them. I know what it's like to end up there and to kind of have your mind change. I know the mental health impacts. I know it can be really hard to empathize with these people, but I am never going to incite violence against them to encourage people to demonize them because that's not going to actually help 
the animals. And so uh, there's some of them. Some of them need to be demons, <laughs> right? I mean, like Harlow and uh, who's that lady in um, <laughs> Elizabeth? Uh, yes. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, and, some and of them are there's, pretty there's, villainous. There's, you know, there's people that you can sort of like point out what is going on. But I think in the scheme of things, when we look at how these systems work and how they continue. Yeah, they're not all we, Dr. Mangala, right? No, they're like, and if we can pull people like myself, you know, out, these people who are not, you know, already so kind of uh, indoctrinated. Um, and there are, I mean, through my activism, I have had people from all over the country um, and even outside of the country message me um uh, like and have like said like keep me anonymous but i wanted to mm. say that like i i've done xyz i've been in this lab i you know i appreciate what you're doing you know and and those connections i'm then actually connecting with um you know again anonymously with some media yeah. uh so like the more we can can accept that if we are actually being more compassionate as opposed to this kind of like attacking yeah there's gonna be more people that that come out i mean and you know yeah. i know i know that there's a lot of people like <laughs> i i have had some of the worst stuff said to me i mean go to hell sure. you deserve ptsd um but you know i think that we are and you weren't even that you weren't even the one doing the experiments well, i mean you what this is what I mean by like it's I get that like people are super angry with Elizabeth Murray I get that people are super you know whatever with Harlow same mm. but does you know just like wishing violence on them like like what do you think it's like well, for someone like me who works in a lab who sees that am I going to be more likely to like start to continue to move along this direction or to be like oh god yeah. and activists are terrifying I think some of them are terrifying and I'm always someone who preaches against violence. I think even the people, even the ALF who were kind of scary, uh, were they would break in and free the monkeys. They didn't break up. They didn't break in and hang experimenters, you sure, know, sure. they, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I, I feel like violence is always something that's lurking and, and kind of threatened, yeah. but it, oh, yeah. it, it hasn't really happened. I've never heard of a, of a, of an experimenter. I've, I've heard of things happening, like their cars getting keyed or, mm. or you know, some vandalism, yeah. but I've never heard of like actual violence being perpetrated against them. Um, yeah. So yeah, I get what you mean though. Like we need to be compassionate to the people that are, I mean, when I went on my vivisection tour with PETA, they, what they showed me, they showed me a lot of stuff, right. And mm. to, to bone up on vivisection and kind sure. of train me about some, you know, I was pretty good, but, I had to, I had some stuff to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, so I had like a week of training about vivisection and how it all works and who's, who are the main culprits and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but the video, one of the videos they made a show was um, watches called test subjects and it won, it yeah. won a BAFTA. Yep. It, and I've test subjects that. is primarily about the human toll yep. that's mm -hmm. being taken. And it really, it did open my eyes because it brought me to tears. Some of these people, because they, for anybody who doesn't know, it's someone, people who were experimenters, some dropped out of school and some kept on going. And yeah. either way they went, they experienced tremendous trauma because yeah. once they got to the point where they had to answer to their conscience, yeah. some subdued that conscience and some listened, but they were yeah. screwed any, either way yeah. they were screwed. Yeah. Like yeah. it's horrible. You quit. You're a pariah. Everyone ha yes. hates you, and you want to, and you hate yourself, and you gave up right. your career. If you carry it out, you hate yourself. You can't do it. You can't live with yourself. So right. it's like, yeah, it's there's there's this kind of lose lose situation, and yeah. there's a real human know, toll happening. There is, and it's not to say that like what's going on to the animals doesn't matter because that's absolutely not true. That's why we're even having this conversation. Right. I but mean, to not consider them yes. the human – absolutely. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. I, I I think some strongly worded emails every once in a while are okay. <laughs> but I don't think that we should be threatening to kill anybody or anything. I think that that's obviously beyond the pale, right? Like yeah. that's not the goal of activism. The I, goal is to get – Yeah. Stop it. Well, and I just – I think that one of the things that I'm really hoping is that – 
you know, I, and, you know, we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, but I co-founded this organization called Justify. Um, and the name is, is very, you know, kind of associated with what we, what we justify in mm -hmm. the name of science and, and how we justify it and what the impacts of that are. And, you know, it's co it's co-founded by me and, uh, two other former lab workers, uh, one of which was actually undercover. So, she came at this at a completely different sort of mm. side of things, but came to the same conclusions because she saw she would, you know, she it, she learned from so many people in the lab how like what it how it was impacting them. Um, and she wasn't even prepared. Like, so she was already an animal activist. This is uh, Lindsay Oliver, who is okay. um, the executive director of World Animal Protection US. So she is also co-founder of Justify. And then um, we have Mallory uh, Cormier, who is uh, who founded Save the Buns, a, a bunny rescue, getting bunnies out of out mm -hmm. of labs. Um, but you know, we all have these different perspectives, and talking to each other was really healing because we were able to sort of talk about things that a lot of people don't understand because they've never been on the inside. And as we did that, we came to sort of realize that this is going to be really impactful because we can start to pull some other people in who are kind of dangling or starting to question things and don't mm. have anywhere to turn because animal activists can be really scary <laughs> and the industry is not going to support them yeah. in that way. So like, where do they go? And that is yeah. what justify is meant to do. And, Amazing. um, you know, I'm hoping to, to build some bridges between activists and those, you know, working in labs again, not to say that I think what you're doing in the lab is great, but just to understand that the language we use, especially, you know, mm. online, the, these individuals are seeing that, um, mm. and that is impacting whether or not they feel comfortable changing uh, coming, coming forward, talking about what's going on, which, you know, when we talk more about what's going on in the labs from the perspective of people in the labs, I think that's going to really. Yeah. I mean, I get that completely, Maddie, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with, I agree. It's just that my reluctance is only that I, 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 like when I have conversations with people, when I was in, um, I was in Detroit at the, at Wayne state and they were doing, um, a lot of dog congenital heart disease mm -hmm. on uh, experiments on dogs. And, um, and I talked to an experimenter yes. and I had a fascinating conversation with that person because I'm able to add, ask some questions and, and we come to this understanding. I don't, I think we both walked away from the conversation better. Right. Um, and I, I wish that we could all have these nice conversations, Yeah. but we can't, there has to be some megaphones and, and screaming and yelling too. I don't know how we strike that balance. You know, I, I don't know. It's hard. I, I know I hear you that I wish that everyone can have these nice conversations, but that's not always what activism looks like either. Sometimes it's, yeah. sometimes it's shouting. Sometimes it's yelling stop because. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I don't necessarily think that shouting or yelling stop is a problem, but I think if you, you know, if you are yelling like, you know, yeah, I guess dog, it dog killer or something yeah. like it's like that that becomes very personal. And again, mm. I'm not saying it's wrong. You know, like I'm not saying like I didn't personally kill a monkey, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't in there contributing to whatever was going on. Yeah. But OK, like but let me ask you about these chancellors. Like I ran out onto the um, <laughs> I ran I ran out onto Fenway and I talked to the uh, I talked I I shouted at the uh, at Fenway Park, at the Chancellor of University of Massachusetts, because he mm -hmm. tortures baby monkeys in menopause sure. experiments. Yeah, um, I mean the horrific shit, like uh, Doctor Mengele stuff, where they rip the uterus yeah. out of yeah. monkeys and mm -hmm. tape uh, hand warmers to them. Yeah, and I ran out of the field. I held my sign. I said, mm -hmm. "Please stop torturing baby monkeys. Stop torturing baby monkeys." Yeah, and as as he was throwing out the first pitch of the ball game, mm -hmm. um, what about guys like that? Am I am I still allowed to yell stop torturing monkeys? You monkey torture at a, at the University of Massachusetts <laughs> Chancellor. Like he's, I'm not talking about jobbers like you going in like you know you know, yeah, cleaning yeah, up yeah, the monkey yeah. cages. I'm talking to the guy who could snap his fingers. Yeah. 
and it would stop. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm like the authority to decide like <laughs> what someone should and shouldn't do. Like, is it what I personally would do? No. Cause that's not my like mean, like that doesn't feel like the best use of my, like, yeah, I get it. My skills, my, whoever I am sure. yeah. is, it, you know, but like, I do think that especially at these schools with the people who are on top, especially outside of the labs who are helping to protect them, who are, you know, like they do need to be confronted. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't have the perfect answer for that. My, my piece is just, just stop that, threatening like, violence. I like that. Let's I like yeah, that. Well, but. and it, it's just like, I really, I really see so much potential for human and animal like welfare at, at trying to be more, you know, again, like I, mean, I sometimes compassion just feels sort of like, Oh, be compassion. But mm -hmm. like, I'm like, be, you don't have to support what someone's doing to totally. be more compassionate in your words. Um, yeah. and how you sort of talk about the issue. I still think that you should be talking about the experiences of the animals to be talking about, you know, yeah why why this is wrong um but that doesn't mean that like you know you see so many comments that are just like you know i don't know like animal tortures you should all die and it's like what does that do like yeah. does that help the animals just like do these comments help or would it be more helpful no to, like it's a good point i mean the, i don't i don't do so much on the um on the social media side of yeah. things with this but um and but, I guess that's where a lot of my background comes from is seeing yeah. how, how like the both sides work and how, mm. you know, the industry is able to, to say that so many of us look like unhinged, you know, because this is what they see so much when I'm an animal yeah. rights activist and I do not talk like that. Um, but I still feel like I'm able to raise awareness for these animals and I'm mobilizing people that, don't even identify as animal activists. Yeah, I think the difficulty lies in that I would certainly crank up my rhetoric when talking to someone who represents these organizations, yeah. or like again, who represents those departments. They I might call animal torturers or yeah. you know killers and these things, but I I, I don't I, I have met some of the people that are doing like the experiments on the ground floor, like who are just you know. They're lab techs, basically, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I've met lots of those people over the years, and I have civil conversations with them. Yeah, I I don't have civil conversations with the organizations themselves or the the figureheads of those organizations. You know, sure. yeah. I, I guess I, I guess I, the reason why I, I I'm curious is just because you know, being an activist, I, I definitely want to make the. I, I want to do it all, so I don't really. <laughs> I don't really like yeah. I'll, I'll I'll do anything. I'll, I'm, I say yes. I, I will do anything because I don't know what works. Mm -hmm. I don't know what works and I don't have the arrogance to think that I do. So I will try anything. <laughs> um, but I, I but I get what you're saying. Like, I also want to be compassionate. I want to meet people with grace and yeah. give them grace. And I, I think there's far, far too little grace to go around. And so I completely understand your sentiment. I wish that we would. I wish that that line was clearer like there was a mendoza line somewhere where you can say like everyone under this position chill a little bit everyone over this position mm -hmm. fuck those guys scream and yell you know what i mean like right that line yeah. must exist somewhere yeah. um anyway i only had uh i wanted to ask you just uh, just one short thing about mm -hmm. um when you were doing you were at harlow and the famous case that is always sparked my imagination that happened at University of um, of Massachusetts, Wisconsin, is the double trouble case with the. Have you ever heard of this case with the the cats that they poison the ears and they put the device in her head? Did you ever see any dogs and cats in the labs and that stuff? No, no? Mm -mm. Um, I know I like know a bit about what you're referring to, but yeah, there weren't uh, dogs and cats in the lab that like my lab was just monkeys so just monkeys because I, I wasn't I, exposed to that yeah I, I guess i'm curious just for my own kind of um curiosity because they they when you look at their page it says that they test on farm animals they test yeah. on fish they test on embryos yeah. they test on uh, monkeys of course uh, various primates yep. and 
Um, when you go in, how separated are the species? I guess like, is it, I don't know. This is going to oh, sound yeah, They're in different buildings, different parts of the campus. Um, okay. Cause like even like farmed animals, like some of them, some of the testing has to do with like agriculture. Itself. Right. Like not, not necessarily like, I don't know, like the testing yeah. that, yeah. Right. They're not behavioral testing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's it's literally all different parts of the campus. Okay. Um, so I, I don't even know necessarily where the other labs, and that's usually how it is. I mean, a lot of people, um, Ryan, for example, again, the, the other plaintiff on uh, the NIH case, um, he's like, I used to bike past the primate labs every day, had no idea those were primate labs. Yeah. So yeah. um, it's, you know, hidden in plain sight. Some of them have signs. And they yeah. Just, and, and there is. Out. I mean, it says yeah. Harlow Primate Lab, but it's so, yeah. <laughs> so it's like so kind of, yeah, <laughs> that it's like, it's very easy to just be walking by and not pay attention. I mean, when it's I worked a at, uh, building. I worked at Disneyland as a teenager <laughs> and there's a, uh, have you ever been to Disneyland in California? I I went to one of them okay, once, so, as a okay. child, and I I don't know. I wasn't a Disney person. I was terrified of the the haunted house or something, and I guess I never went back. <laughs> okay, so there's a so it, I, I, not to get deep into this, but uh, at Disneyland, uh, a lot of it it's all it's all artifice, right? Everything's fake. Every, that's what people like yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they've invented this color that they can paint. And you don't see it. It's 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 a very bizarre phenomenon. It, you can look it up at home if you want. Um, so there's a, a parking structure that's painted this color, and uh-huh. unless you're looking directly at it, you don't see it. It's just like out of your peripheral vision, you don't uh-huh. see it. And there's lots of stuff like that at Disneyland that's right there in front yeah, of you. Yeah, but if but you're not looking for it, you just like don't see it. And the color is called no seeum. No see them green. Sure. <laughs> no see them green. That's what it's called. And it, it do, it's really weird that your eye, they've yeah, done studies yeah. that your eye just doesn't, just doesn't notice it. Hmm. It's very, that's and I feel like that's what's happening at, at yeah. this too. Yeah. Um, so outside of animal rights, that's now consumed your entire life. Is there anything <laughs> else that you're like into about, like, is there any kind of a uh, nerd culture pop do you watch any shows or read any books or do any do you watch star trek or anything like that (laughs) (laughs) do you nerd out Um, about anything besides primates yeah yeah in the first amendment um (laughs) very very much so um yeah i um you know i what's what what are things about me do you have a a hobby for example what what makes you a human maddie what makes me a human i mean i don't know if this is like so far outside of the animal rights realm but like my dog is like my entire life um she's sort (laughs) of like like i call her my soulmate actually in the washington post well the first washington post feature uh someone someone had commented that there was like something clearly wrong with me because i called my dog my soulmate and i was like (laughs) that's what you're picking up from this that's Um, (laughs) that's what i don't like about her she's a dog lover yeah yeah so um i i just thought that was like funny but yeah i love hiking with her and just kind of like doing everything with her but like aside from that um i'm actually uh like one of the ways that i you know, work is babysitting. I'm a big kid lover. I love, oh, really? I love kids. I love infants, babies. So like I, I spend time with little ones a lot. Um, and like I enjoy primates. that. Yeah, no, I mean, I studied, I double majored in child development and so, oh. so, um, yeah. So like, I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, I, but yeah, like, uh, I don't know. So I sweet. do. I guess, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm really into uh, the true crime podcast, Morbid. <laughs> um, I I like to pretend that, um, that you know, the co-hosts are like my friends, but, you know, they don't actually know that I exist. Or a good, a good, par- a good, healthy parasocial exactly. relationship. Yes. yes. So I think Nothing that's like wrong where, with that. right. That's where I'm like most, most relatable is um, my, my desire to, to be <laughs> their friends uh, or their friends. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> their friends with the, the, with yes. the true crime. Yes. 
Morbid. Okay, yeah. I got it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've I've heard of that one, so it must be yeah. it's a pretty popular one, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I don't know how I even came across it, but like, I just feel like I'm hanging out with friends when I listen to it, and that's what this show's kind of like. This yeah. is a show. This is a show for vegan friends. Uh, right. We call it VFFs, Vegan Family yeah. Forever. Um, awesome. So, how can people follow Justify or follow mm -hmm. you? Is there is there a social yeah. media uh, handle that you can throw out there that people can? Yeah. Kind of follow you and see what's up. Yeah. So my social media uh, is like at Madeline underscore Krasno. So it's like literally my name um, on uh -huh. Instagram. But yeah, basically search Madeline Krasno. You'll find me on whatever in, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook you know okay. um and then uh justify uh the handle is like at when we justify when we uh, justify yeah so like justify it. was taken so it's at when we justify when we justify mm -hmm. like Got our it. website is when we justify.org um, awesome and then yeah. after after we um after we after i've finished this broadcast i'll put it in the show notes too so people cool. can click on it later and um Thank you so much, Maddie, for opening my eyes and helping me think through this. I, I, I really loved having met you because I, I I was following the story a little bit. And then once the victory happened, I was so stoked. I was... Oh, same. I was still, like, I just like, feel real. Like, yeah, I, it's a huge win. Yeah. It's, a, it's a giant win for... It's not just a win... Yeah. For you, it's not just a win for this yeah. Madison thing. It's not just a win for yeah. the NIH. It's a win for activism. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's got it's got some massive implications that absolutely pan out. So I just am I'm pretty pretty lit up. <laughs> yeah. Immediately I think about the USDA and how often they censor shit. I mean, yeah. they got they literally just got sued because of that uh, stupid Aubrey Plaza thing. Like yeah. it's always <laughs> they <laughs> because you're not allowed to take public funds and denigrate a a a, right. a, a product that we make here. Yes. Anyway. Yes. It's like details. Details. <laughs> you know, following the law and stuff. <laughs> following the law isn't just for you and me. It's for them right. too. Yeah. Yeah. No. And this should be. I mean, my favorite. I think like the best way to end this is like that quote. The my favorite quote is when, uh, based on the court's ruling, they said something like, oh, "What did they call it?" Um, I feel like they've, oh, here we go. Uh, like one of the, the, the people had said to say that comments related to animal testing are categorically off topic when a significant portion of NIH's posts are about research conducted on animals defies common sense. Like that is such a, like, to me, like a slap in the Face. Totally. What you're doing defies common sense. <laughs> yes, you defy. And this is to the NIH. <laughs> so anyway, that's. I just think that was like so beautifully said. Love that it's in like all of the articles, the press relief, the release, the Washington Post. Like it's beautiful. Yes, it makes them look like fools, the fools that they are. And because <laughs> after all, the NIH, they're the real monsters. It's not the people like everyone else is trying to make a buck. It's yeah. NIH that's the real monsters. And we're in charge of that. We should not be funding these experiments. Yeah. Adopt the uh, research modernization deal. Right. That yeah. and straight up take these funds and help people access stuff that already exists. Help mental oh. health care, health insurance, medications. Most people just can't, they can't even afford stuff that we already have. And mm. that's not changing. It's like the number of people Good I point. know who are like, I can't afford therapy. I can't prioritize this. Yeah. And it's like, and yet here we are trying to induce like extreme anxiety and, and macaques uh, to improve, medicine. to improve therapeutics. Yes, you're absolutely right. No one can afford therapy, but we're, what we but, have plenty yeah. of money to um, yes. do mad experiments. Exactly. To improve therapy, maybe. Right. Well, and again, to create me to maybe eventually come up with a drug that will then be <laughs> inaccessible. Yeah. Keep doing it. At yeah, least we'll yeah. get published. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, that whole system needs to be addressed as well. But, right. Yeah. Um, there's plenty that's of ways what to all this is about. Because if we can't have street. that conversation, you mm -hmm. know, with who's funding it, then how are we going to address it? 
You're absolutely right. I totally, I couldn't agree more. And I think you've done an incredible service to your country. So yes. thank you for your service. Thank you for yours. <laughs> it was well, really wonderful to meet you. <laughs> awesome. I, I appreciate you so much. And I hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay. Yes, sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Bye. She's amazing. Look at that. What an incredible what an incredible person who's done such incredible things. And um, I can't wait to see what happens next. We're going to see all sorts of cool things happening from her. It's, the story's not over. Everything is everything is changing now. Everything is, is uh, up for grabs. The implications are far and wide. I can't wait. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah, ma amazing, Maddie. Thank you so much. Exactly. We need to reprioritize. Do no harm. Exactly. Agreed. Maddie is awesome, says Karina V. Thank you so much for being here. 